I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support too. That's where Ollie comes in with their delightful, hardworking gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with a special CHP episode special because I've invited two esteemed guests on the show to lend a modicum of expertise and gravitas to the episode. If you're a listener of this Chinese literature podcast, you know Lee and Rob Moore. Back in 2018, after numerous requests from a multitude of listeners to feature Lin Yu Tang as a CHP topic, I reached out to Lee and Rob, and for a few years, we've gone back and forth and said we were going to cover this topic together. I wanted to fly up to Oregon to do it in person, but, well, after all this time, plus the whole COVID thing, despite our best efforts, we never got it done until today. So let me give a warm CHP welcome to Lee Moore and Rob Moore, proprietors of the Chinese Literature Podcast. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. It's a thrill to be on. It's We're, we're huge fans. I've been listening to, to the podcast since man, probably 2013 when I was in Taiwan, and you're the, you're the one Lee that clued me into the podcast. Yeah, and the Chinese History China History podcast is one of the reasons we started a podcast in the first place because we were like, "Hey, this is really great." There's nothing like this though, just for literature. So yeah. when we were thinking about starting the podcast, Laszlo, we actually kind of tried to combine your podcast with uh, the Seneca podcast and the sort of. Uh, eruditeness plus a uh, conversation kind of thing. So many thanks to Laszlo. So if you, if you enjoy Laszlo's podcast, uh, many thanks to you for supporting it and letting us do what we do. We are, we are sort of the moon to, to Laszlo's sun. We reflect his, his glory. Jeez. I don't know. <laughs> nolly, nolly. <laughs> I was reading something about podcasting and it said a lot of Pi Ma P helps. Well, then there you go. <laughs> All right. We've been talking about this for years. Yeah. And yes. finally, the day has come. So before we dive right into his literary feats, let me start with a brief bio of his early years. Lin Yu Tang, he was born on Double Ten Day, 1895, in the mountain village of Banzai, Pinghe County, just outside of Changzhou, which means he was a Hokkien Chinese. His father was a second generation pastor. His mother, uh, I guess you can call her a traditional Chinese mother, bound feet and a devotion to her family and children that Mengzi's mother surely would have approved, taking care of their family of six boys and two girls. 1895, he was born six months after the signing of the Treaty of Shimonoseki, which marked the beginning of a very terrible time for China with respect to what lay ahead with Japan. The Guangxu Emperor was on the throne, and the Dowager Empress Cixi was at the peak of her formidable powers. Young Lin Yu Tang attended the Union Middle School, 1904 to 1910. The school was located in Xiamen on the island of Gulangyu, site of the international settlement, so the site of foreigners, very early on was a regular thing, and Lin got a look at what they were up to and what they were all about. The summers were spent at home in his mountain village. 1911 and 1916, following the revolution, he studied at St. John's in Shanghai, founded 1879, called the Harvard of China in its day. The communists shut it down in 1952. And one of his earliest influences was the writer Gu Hongming, the first of many to follow. 1916 to 1919, things began to happen for Lin Yutang. The warlord era was taking off following Yuan Shikai's death in June 1916. He taught English for a while at Tsinghua University, a secular institution unlike St. John's. And it's during this period at Tsinghua in Beijing that he began to stray from his very strict Christian upbringing. In this age of rejuvenation in Chinese intellectual society, he tapped into the ethos that cast 
sort of a gimlet eye at the missionaries in general and how they were perceived as being well, unfair to the Chinese people, particularly how they often disparage them in the press and their writings and dispatches back home. And like a lot of Chinese intellectuals at the time, he began to look at them more critically. In Beijing, he met more influential people, and namely Hu Shi and Chen Du Xiu. He dove headfirst into the new culture movement, and for the first time, feeling a little top-heavy with Western learning, he gets to know the Chinese classics that he had ignored all these years during his Christian missionary education. And he blamed the missionaries for this. He didn't like all the swipes they took at Confucian learning and philosophy, as well as their prohibition of ancestor worship. And in the summer of 1919, with the May 4th movement now in full swing, he married another Hokkien woman, Liao Cui Feng. The marriage will last 57 years until Lin's death in 1976. In 1919, Lin received a scholarship to attend Harvard, and together with his new bride, they sailed to America. He attended Harvard, but ran into financial trouble early on due to matters relating to his scholarship and complications from his wife's appendicitis. And far from home and financially strapped, he was able to scrape together enough money and they headed to Europe, where he briefly engaged in teaching basic literacy to some of the Chinese labor corps men. And then in 1921, he studied at the University of Leipzig. Money continued to be a problem, but uh, Hu Shi pulled through with funds that assisted in keeping Lin's head above water. And after some supplementary courses at the University of Jena, he was able to receive his master's in comparative lit from Harvard in absentia. Afterwards, he received his PhD from the University of Leipzig. His dissertation was on Chinese ancient phonetics. And he became the first Chinese scholar to receive a doctoral in linguistics from an overseas university. 1923, he returned to Beijing with the warlord era now in full swing. He gets to know all the shining stars on the literary scene at the time, of which there were quite a few. And this included Lu Xun, 14 years his senior, and a colleague that he'd have a very close but uh, stormy relationship with all the way up to uh, Lu Xun's death in 1936. In 1924, uh, in an essay in the uh, Beijing Morning Post, the Chen Bao, he coined the term humor, yu mo, is a transliteration of the English word humor. Then in 1925, Sun Yat-sen died in Beijing. Lin Yutang attended the funeral. And at the time, he was teaching at the English Department of the National Teachers College for Women. And during this period, he was part of the team led by Zhao Yuan Ren, that developed the Guo Yu Lu Ma Zi, Chinese romanization method that became one of the standards for many decades. Whilst in Beijing, he accepted a post as the dean of the Women's Normal College. This was in 1926. And by now, writers and others who were critical of the warlords were getting roughed up and in many cases murdered. One had to be mindful of what they were printing in those days, like it is with a lot of dictators today. And going back to the, gee, the Zhou dynasty, they didn't like it when others pointed a finger at them for their tyranny or corrupt leadership. Now, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I read somewhere that it was Lin Yutang who coined the term dog meat general for the warlord, uh, Zhang Zongchang. So whatever the case, Lin's writings in the many journals of the day landed him in a lot of hot water. And he made it to Duan Chi Rui's blacklist. And with some assistance to help get him out of harm's way in Beijing, he accepted a position as dean of the Chinese department at Xiamen University, not too far from his home in the mountains west of Zhangzhou. So the position was ill-fated. And after coming into conflict with colleagues and trustees, he accepted a government position as secretary to the foreign minister in Wuhan. So he moved to he moved to Hanko with his wife and two daughters, the oldest three years old, plus a newborn. And alas, in no time at all, in 1927, Lin discovers he's not cut out for government work. So he opts instead 
to move to Shanghai and give it a go as a full-time writer. Here we can begin the story of his shining literary career. So, Rob, why don't you start us off? It's 1927. The Shanghai Massacre just happened, and the White Terror is unleashed on all communists, leftists, and, well, anyone who writes in any publication that the nationalists are not a great bunch of guys. He's off and running. What happens during this most fertile literary period in Shanghai? Well, it's kind of funny because given the the political climate, you would expect any good Chinese modern writer to be writing something incendiary or something that's going to rouse the populace. He writes something called the Lun Yu Ban Yu Kan, the Analex <laughs> Fortnightly, which is a humor magazine. So two problems with that. One, it's a humor magazine, not your your t- tend to, not the thing you tend to go to in a climate like this. Also, it's drawn at least the name from the Analects, the Lunyu, which is, uh, of course, Confucius. And once again, if you're a writer in the 1930s in China and you want to be in with the modern crowd, Confucius is not the way to do that. Um, what's interesting about his writing for the Analects fortnightly and in other sort of periodicals at this period is that you get a taste of why it matters, and, and, and you know, Lazo, you mentioned this earlier, that Lean comes at the Chinese classics almost secondhand, right? He's not educated the same way other colleagues like Lu Xun were in the classics. St. John's exam University system. was not, I mean, it was more focused on a Western education. Exactly. Right? Um, he's deeply fascinated by this. It's kind of a way of reclaiming something important to him. So for him, there's nothing, there, there's no disconnect at all between bringing in talk of Confucius in a period like this. Um, it's not necessarily something he sees eye to eye on with a lot of his contemporaries. But isn't it weird that he's taking this like most ancient of texts, or not most ancient, but but this very much associated with oldness uh, and the Chinese tradition, and he's kind of making it out into a you know, a publication that, yeah, that a gets put out. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's super weird. I, I, I don't understand. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's this kind of juxtaposition of two things that don't belong together that that's kind of funny in and of themselves. Right. Right. And you know, Lu Xun, uh, famously called it bric-a-brac for the bourgeoisie. Like he was not a fan. To as, be fair, I mean, Lu Xun did in uh, say a sim. He, I think he called uh, the the Gugong Bo Yuan, the Palace Museum, something like that, bric-a-brac from the imperial right, household. Right. So, and it, this we should also point out this is also the period when Lu Xun is writing his Zawen, which this is the point when Lu Xun is full on into socialism and political activism. Some of the stuff in they wrote in the twenties. Uh, was much more experimental and frankly much more interesting. Uh, the 30s is where he's really, he's all in, you know. So, yeah, the 1930s, Lu Xun would definitely not have appreciated the Analects fortnightly. Uh, I, I also, Laszlo, before we kind of discuss what he's writing, I think it's important to maybe mention the context of literary Shanghai in the 1930s when he is coming up with these things. Uh, you have uh, Shu Zetsun, and a couple of other writers who are coming up and writing these incredibly weird things. Rob, you mentioned that, uh, you know, if you were like a true patriot, you would be writing something against the Japanese or some some of these more patriotic kind of things, which, you know, looking back 100 years from that period, or I guess 90 years right now, um, a lot of that stuff is is claptrap and and we don't read it and it's not interesting. Uh, but Shu Zetsun and these other Shanghai writers are writing really fascinating kind of experimental stuff. It's it's the new sensationalist movement, the Xin Gan Jue Pai. Uh, it's a that's a term that's drawn to describe a lot of Shanghai writers in the 1930s. Lin Yutang is kind of out there on his own, isn't he? He's he, his writing is. I don't I don't even know. It's where neither to, experimental nor sort of. Patriotic. militaristic, whatever. And it's also bilingual. Uh, he's writing in Chinese and English, which is very, very unique. So also during this time, not only uh, was he doing the Analex Fortnightly, he was also uh, doing a column in the uh, China Critic Weekly called The Little Critic. And these uh, little essays he was doing attracted the attention of a Pearl S. Buck, who convinced him in 1933 to write a book that explained China to the West. And we should probably mention, Lazo, that Pearl Buck, for those of y'all who don't 
know this, she actually won the Nobel Prize in 1938 for a book that she published, I believe, in 1931 called The Good Earth. It's the most famous English language book about China. And today it's largely forgotten. Um, Laszlo, have you have you had to suffer through The Good Earth? Well, you know, in my formative years, I, uh, of course, I, I read it and, and enjoyed it as well as uh, the, the movie would complete with all its yellow face. And uh, I forgot there was a movie. Oh, yeah. Yellow face oh. at, its, at its worst. At the end of the sixth happiness. I was uh, I was into all that stuff when I was little. I can't watch it for five minutes without cringing. But these were early gateways for me as a young kid to Chinese culture, Chinese history. So, hmm. and by the way, it was uh, Lin Yutang who actually nominated Pearl Buck for her uh, uh, Nobel. There's there's a little bit of share and share alike then because she's the one that convinces Lin Yutang to write a book introducing China to the West. And and Pearl Pearl Buck and Lin Yutang are both kind of in the 1930s these they they epitomize this kind of China explainer. Uh, they they talk about China to the West, and and that's really what Lin Yutang's first book in English, uh, My Country, My People, is all about. My Country, My People is just an exploration of the Chinese character, but it's packaged in this way for an American audience. This is a hugely successful book. Uh, it's one of uh, one of the books that he has that ends up on the New York Times bestseller list, even though it's largely forgotten today. Um, seven printings in four months that book had. 1935. Yeah, that was a sensation in 1935. And it's weird because when you go back and read the book, he is an incredibly good writer. You can see that immediately. Like, I, I think Pearl Buck, I've, I've, I've suffered through her. Um, I don't, I don't think she's a horrible writer, but I don't think she's a great writer. But Lin Yutang is actually a great stylist in terms of his his use of the English language. Like there were some some times when some pages where I was just kind of stunned at how good he was. Uh, but no one reads him anymore, and it's just it's very weird how he in this book and also in the importance of living. It's it's a strange experience because he talks in this very uh, racialized way. He'll talk about, um, you know, the Chinese, this is what they do. This is their character. This is their temperament, that kind of stuff. And it was, it was really strange going back and reading this as I prepared for this podcast to, to try and kind of wrap my head around all of Lin Yutang's kind of both his great writing and his really 1930s style racism. And yet, to to go back though to one of Laszlo's biographical points, to some extent, Lin Yutang is always coming at questions of what it means to be Chinese secondhand. Because whereas so many other people were brought up in the in the stuff that you were supposed to read to know what you you to know what it means that you're Chinese, it, he's coming at it after the fact. So to some extent, it makes sense that he writes about this kind of almost in the way Pearl Buck does, where it's like he's studying his own culture, right? That would make sense to have that sort of racialized voice doing that. And Jing Su, who is a scholar at, at Yale in the Chinese department there, has uh, did a chapter on Lin Yutang uh, in her, her book, Sound and Script in Chinese Diaspora. And she makes this point that whenever Lin Yutang is writing in English, he's always explaining... China sympathetically to a Western audience. He's very much in the corner of the the Chinese that he's writing about. But when he writes in Chinese, he's always highly critical of of the Chinese. He's very uh, deprecating of the Chinese as a, as a as a nation. And so it's just kind of this this question. I mean, Rob, you know, there's a famous uh, a famous line that I think all people who do comparative literature know that. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Italian for traitor and translator is pretty much the same thing. Right. Uh, I feel like that's sort of the case with Lin Yutang is that every time he's translating something or every time he is going out, changing languages, he's betraying something. I guess it depends how you see betraying. Um, but 
the question I would have is the extent to which he's defending China to himself, uh, because he was brought up in a much more Western schooling. Something like my country, my people is sort of almost an, an attempt to uh, defend China to his own part of himself, even. Um, you know, you mentioned, Lee, that the importance of living a second ago. That comes two years after my country, my people. So that's 1937. 1930. All that wind in his sails from the uh, from my country, my people, Pearl Buck and her husband, Richard J. Walsh, he was the publisher at John Day and Company, who later published Lin Yutang. May 1936, they convinced him to move to the United States. So... Lin Yutang, his wife, kids, they pick up and they move to New York. And he was looking forward to do some writing without the, having to deal with the, the censorship and the dangers of getting assassinated for, for being critical of Japan or the nationalists, which was like constant danger for writers in China at that time. And he got to New York. He wrote a steady stream of articles for the New York Times and various magazines and becomes known as one of these great liberal cosmopolitan intellectuals. He's the toast of the town. And he began this, well, what as we've already started to say, this long career as this authoritative voice of uh, for the American public explaining China. And he's outspoken in America on all matters, cultural and political, regarding China and Asia. During this, the 1930s, despite everything happening in China, all that trauma, he wasn't so politically passionate, not in the 1930s, but that, of course, is uh, going to change uh, when the 1940s roll around. Right. Um, and in some ways, it makes sense that you have two books like The Importance of Living in My Country and My People be as bestsellers in America at this time. Precisely because of what the Japanese are doing in yeah. China. So, I mean, this this book, The Importance of Living, was on the New York Times uh, bestseller list for 52 weeks. It was the, Is that correct? It was the most That's... read book in the United States in 1938. Wow. Those are like J.K. Rowling numbers for the 30s. <laughs> and what's, what's fascinating for me is, you know, Rob and I teach Chinese literature – at the University of Oregon or have taught Chinese literature at the University of Oregon. And he, in this book, which is the most popular book in 1938 in America, is talking about Sudongpo. He's talking about Zhuangzi. He's talking about Tao Yuanming. And when we talk about those uh, those authors, those poets, our students kind of, the, at least the ones who are Americans, kind of blank stares, never heard of them. You know, it, it, it's crazy to think that in the 1930s, China was not... Uh, some it it was it was actually much closer to America culturally in terms of the exchanges than it is today in 2021. And you had uh, readers in the 1930s knowing who Su Dongpo was, knowing who Zhuangzi was. These the kinds of things he talks about in this book are are I think the importance of living is a little bit more interesting than my country, my people, because with my country, my people, he's just wrong on a lot of things like I, I i don't i don't want to sugarcoat it too much but he 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 explains why communism will never successfully take hold in china because the chinese are too uh human not humane but human in their concerns and it just it just communism could not work out in china obviously uh uh he he has been proved wrong on that in several other points uh but but in the importance of being, uh, the importance of living, I almost wanted to say the importance of being earnest. Right. In the importance of living, he's doing this kind of interesting philosophical literary discussion that, you know, it's kind of Rob. It's sort of what we kind of aspire to. We 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 like talking about on our podcast. We like talking about Chinese literature, but we'll always try and you know have some 1980s uh, rock Pop music, culture hair, reference. you know, Beatles music or something, kind of mixing those two discussions in there. What's what's crazy is he's doing it successfully in the 1930s during the Great Depression. Right. And also, let me, let me add, uh, 1937, while he's writing The Importance of Living, 
uh, Japan invades China. So you have the Marco Polo Bridge incident. And from that point on, he can't return to China. He's now stuck in the United States and begins his career as this influencer, you know, writing about uh, China's plight to a Western audience, to a, to an isolationist American populace. And he very, uh, very nicely articulated what Japan was doing to China in the war. Because by, by August, there was, it was all out war raging between China and Japan while he's uh, doing this, which was when Importance of Living came out. And he he takes on that role of of I, I think that word you used Laszlo is a, a great word. I mean, we use the term influencer as as like social media influencer today, but but he really was the social media influencer for China. He was uh, he was the kind of uh, cultural diplomat for China in the 1930s. So one of the things that makes Lin Yutong so effective and is as an explainer of what's happening in China is that he himself has suffered from what the Japanese have done. He's he's effectively marooned in the United States. He's kind of a martyr of sorts. Uh, having already been published, everyone knows who he is. Now, all of a sudden, he himself is stranded away from his culture, his home, and his people uh, by the Japanese. That's an instant, that's a much sexier position to be in than just a professor talking about Chinese culture, right? This is this is someone who can tell you firsthand what it's about. And even, and it's especially important, Laz, as you mentioned, that the American public at the time was still very much isolationist. Um, because someone like this is is the kind of writer that has to push the door open, right? Not just, hey, I wrote a piece on this once, I'm a journalist, and now look, I can't go home anymore. Uh, you need to listen. This is This is serious business. He carries a lot of gravitas in his writing because of what he's been through. Yeah, he was preaching this war with Japan that China was fighting was also America's war. A lot of people believe that. Of course, a lot did not. But the sheer, but the sheer fact that the book, The Importance of Living, was on the bestseller list that long points to uh, he's he's catching some people's ear. People are interested. And I believe Pearl Buck was also pushing a similar kind of point. So there, there was this group of uh, people who were advocating for China in the U.S. and and trying to get the U.S. to push back against the Japanese. Yeah, which leads us to 1939, Moment in Peking. That was a, a novel where he laid bare the inhumanity that was going on in China that Japan was heaping on the Chinese people. Yeah, and it's interesting. A Moment in Peking... Um, I still think is a very good novel. Um, it's it's just it's a story of a family starting out in the Boxer Rebellion right at the turn of the century and leading into the 30s with the Japanese, and it follows a series of characters through various trials and tribulations. Um, it's fascinating because with you know we have a lot of translations now of some of the Chinese modern classics, but you can you can see a difference immediately. So Lean explains a lot of the historical background that the average American reader would have had no idea about. Uh, what was the Chinese court doing during the Boxer Rebellion, for example? What does that even mean, the Boxer Rebellion? Uh, he's intentionally, he's taking, he's putting on his schoolmaster hat, but he's presenting something deeply entertaining, right? Um, and it's, 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 it's important that he packages it this way because 1939, we're now getting into where the isolationists are starting to go, you know, maybe we need to move a little bit here, right? Um, this is the best way to package a message like this for an American audience. Not another series of lectures uh, or New York Times articles. It's a story. You can follow a family from not its beginnings, but close to its beginnings, all the way through what the Japanese have done. Like, do you want to know what the Japanese are doing? First, let me tell you about this wonderful Chinese family. Not wonderful isn't perfect, just deep, well-written. And now look what the Japanese are doing to them, right? Um, and it makes an impact. It's, 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 it's deeply moving. In uh, March 1940, this is before Pearl Harbor, Lin Yutang and his family flew to Chongqing. And they met, spent a lot of time with Chiang Kai-shek, Song Mei Ling. And he stayed through late August and survived 40 Japanese bombing raids and that got a nice close up look at the devastation that was happening in China and just the terrible trauma meted out 
Laszlo, you mentioned in 1927 he tried to be a KMT official uh, in Hankou, uh, and it didn't really work out. How does I, I mean? How does he deal politically with some of with kind of with the war? I mean, is he 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 is increasingly on the side of Chiang Kai Shek, right? Yeah, yeah. They gave him an award, uh, the, the the Order of Victory of Resistance Against Aggression. The Nationalist government uh, bestowed on him. He was celebrated as this great son of the Orient, and he had become this unofficial. Chinese ambassador. So, I mean, politically, he was a very important conduit to the American public, to the American government. So the nationalists uh, saw saw him as a very important person for them. Well, the 40s is also, though, when he, his, his son sort of starts to set in China um, because the, the kind of the cachet he gets with American audiences and with some of the nationalist Chinese audience at home because of the war, um, the communists who are very much in the ascendant in China do not appreciate (laughs) what Lin Yutong is doing, not just his novels and his, his political stance and uh, allying himself with the nationalists, but also his continuing advocation of classical studies. Uh, 1942, he publishes the wisdom of China and India, just an edited volume of Chinese and Indian philosophy. Uh, I believe about that time, he he published, he personally translated another volume on Chinese aesthetics. Definitely not. <laughs> Clickbait. That one is not. Um, but it, it, he's not just writing for the popular audience. He's really still pursuing the classical studies he, he was fascinated with from the 20s, right? He's still doing it. And that combination, allying yourself with the nationalists and also writing a lot about the classics, is not going to get you any friends in the Chinese Communist Party. Very critical of Mao and uh, the CCP. And he was he was very close with Agnes Smedley, Edgar Snow, you know, and of course, you know, Pearl Buck was was uh, by no means, I would call her a rightist. But uh, around this time, they all start to sour on him, start to become very critical of his very pro-nationalist, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, bent and uh, his criticism of Mao and the communists. And and I think that's a good way to think about Lin Yutong's reputation because it starts to turn. Um, so 1944, he publishes A Vigil of a Nation, which is highly critical of a lot of aspects of U.S. policy in Asia. He calls out U.S. racism. Um, and uh, as the Cold War starts to heat up, as World War II comes to an end, he uh, he finds himself in some uh, interesting places ideologically. He he just kind of gets pushed to the side. It, it's strange because you know before I, I, we had never Rob had had you ever done Lin Yutang or encountered him in any of your classes? Not in my classes. I'd read him on my own. Right, but I mean, he's just not discussed in the no. academy really any anymore, other than the that that book. Uh, by Jing Su, which I think is really the the first time I had read about Lin Yutang, he he becomes this kind of relic of a pre Cold War era that uh, where where everything uh, changed, and he went from being the most important person to sort of you know just just uh, yesterday's afterthought. news, yeah, yeah, for nineteen forty three, I think with with uh, between tears and laughter. And Vigil of a Nation, those two, where he openly challenged the West on a variety of issues, including racial policy towards China, intellectuals and in the pro-communist and anti-KMT camp, they really turned on him and started openly attacking him. And, you know, we haven't mentioned him, but Lao She was a, him and uh, Lin Yutang were very close, very, uh, Lin Yutang and brought Lao She to the United States. I mean, introduced his work to America and even he was uh, criticizing uh, Lin Yutang. So uh, that was sort of the turning point. Even Pearl Buck and her husband who had published uh, Lin Yutang at John Day, even they sort of turned their back on him, no longer would publish him and. I don't think he got any more Christmas cards from them. <laughs> <laughs> right. He does He does go into this uh, very different stage of his life, though. He's not relevant nationally or internationally either. Or in, literarily. Yeah, or literarily. Like, I, I don't think he really did that much in terms of 
publications that are relevant after this period, but he did something that was incredibly important in another way. He, he kind of starts this engineering phase where he actually invents a Chinese typewriter that is capable of producing something like 7,000 Hanzi, 7,000 characters. Using 72 keys. Yeah, exactly, right? Like previously with typewriters in China, a lot of them had just been sort of mini printing presses almost. You you just kind of find the character that you wanted and kind of put it on there, which was obviously, you know, a waste of time. His typewriter is different. It's called the Ming Kuai typewriter. Uh, Laszlo, did he get the patent for that in 46 or 47? He got the uh, patent for that in 40 six, I believe. 46. And he's, so he produces this, he makes this first, not the first ever Chinese typewriter, but the first uh, really significantly uh, useful one in New York City. Uh, and it, uh, it involves hitting three keys. And then with some combination of those three keys, keys depending on what you hit, you it pops up a character based off of the the different uh, um, the the different stroke orders, and it pops up a character into what's called the magic eye, which is right where you would be typing, and then you uh, you can just kind of enter that onto the typewriter, and it's this fascinatingly. It's a fascinating device because it it's such an amazing feat of engineering and linguistic engineering, really. It has, if I remember correctly, three separate roles that are kind of throwing up these different characters. Uh, just it really anticipates the the way that that today we type Chinese into a computer. And it's something that's totally different from the normal uh, English language typewriter where you hit a key, it pops up with whatever you hit. It's it's different. It you know it 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 requires a rethinking of the typewriter. And do you remember? Uh, it was a few weeks ago, I think it was, or maybe last month. There was this article on Lois Liu. She, she's ninety five years old. She's still living, and she was uh, she was the one who was working with IBM. IBM was also developing their own Chinese typewriter at the time. That was, I think, patented in the same year. Well, it clearly didn't, and neither one really went anywhere, as far as I know. Uh, I know Lin Yutang's finances kind of run out in '47. Uh, yeah, when he when he demoed the uh, his typewriter to the Remington Typewriter Company, it was like one of those classic situations where you know he couldn't get the thing to work, and you know when it came to crunch time, and it was just a, a disaster, oh, it was just a terrible. Yeah, it was just an unmitigated disaster. He was getting. He was getting sued for patent issues. The break with Perlis Buck didn't help because she had been financing him some, and and this typewriter, uh, it's my understanding, partially kind of helped put the nail in the coffin in terms of their relationship. I believe she had loaned him some money, and and when things went south, it, she wasn't happy. So anyway, after after this, after his typewriter doesn't pan out, and he's pretty much broke, uh, forty eight. He decides to go work in Paris with UNESCO. Also doesn't work out. And so he tries to relaunch his career. But by the late 40s, um, due to a lot of reasons, people are not really as interested in more books about China and Chinese wisdom. Well, honestly, I think he's kind of intellectually burnt his bridges, not only with his friends like Pearl Buck, but also I think he's demonstrated that he... You know, everything that he said in the 1930s has has been proven inaccurate or not everything, but but many of the things that he said, many of the the claims he's made are just kind of garbage. Uh, Well, there's also the the simple fact that by the late 40s, China is becoming. Let's see, 49 is the kind of communist revolution. But by the end of World War Two, people are starting to look around and go, you know what? These communists may be a problem after all. And so gradually popular opinion in the U.S. is shifting against China. So trying to kickstart your career explaining China would not be the best move. And it wasn't. He publishes two books in 48. I haven't heard of either. One is just the wisdom of Lao Tzu, which, I mean, really, if you're going to, if you're going to, if you wanted to make some cash publishing, translating Lao Tzu would probably not be the best way to do it (laughs) then or now. (laughs) 
And in fact, one of the novels he writes in 48 is called Chinatown Family. I have never read it. I've never even heard of it. But given his opinions about imperialism and American attitudes towards China, you can sort of see what that novel would be doing. Uh, probably not applauding the American dream. So definitely not going to get him a readership. And 1949, the communists, victorious on the mainland, and Lin Yu Tang is considered a reactionary, and Mao bans him in China. He's, his books are completely taken off the shelf, and he becomes just a complete non-entity in China until... You know, he makes a comeback in the 1980s during uh, Gaika Kaifeng. And from there on, his 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 life is kind of downhill. He kind of bounces around from post to post, uh, publishes a lot. I've never heard of anything he published. In the late 1940s, he publishes The Gay Genius, The Life and Times of Sudong Po, uh, which obviously, like, the title is interesting because it, it means something different today, but it does represent his kind of turn towards scholarship uh, in this period. So in 1954, as he's bouncing around, he accepts a position as a chancellor at uh, Nanyang University in Singapore, and that doesn't really work out. He has a kind of political conflict with the the trustees. He's accused of spending too much Um Within six months, it's all over for him. Um, he uh, Nanyang then merges with the University of Singapore. So he returns to New York City in the late 1950s. Uh, he actually goes back to being a Christian, which is interesting because his father was a second-generation Christian when he was growing up in Fujian. And so Lin Yutang grew up in the church, but he at some point left the church. By the time he's writing My Country, My People, he he claims to be a pagan. Um, and so the 1950s witnesses him, his return to Christianity. Uh, and uh, then the 1960s is kind of just more scholarship, right? Right. He does some translating. He publishes The Importance of Understanding, which I guess is kind of a, an attempt to... to um, like, do you remember the other book I wrote that everyone liked? <laughs> it's like that book, only it's not. He's caught in the middle. I mean, the 1960s, the pro-communist and the anti-communist discourse is so toxic. It was just was very divisive. He ended up becoming homesick. He couldn't go to China. So with great fanfare, 1965 or 1966, Lin Yutang and his wife moved to Taiwan. Was invited there, Taiwan. Yeah, him and his wife. They were they were both Hokkien, so Taiwan. That's it. That's a great place for any Hokkien people. And he felt right at home there. He lived in this beautiful home with gardens up in Yangmingshan. It was a gift from uh, Chiang Kai Shek, and uh, his oldest daughter worked at the uh, National Palace Museum there. And he begins writing. He doesn't completely turn his back on uh, English writing, but. Uh, he begins to do more and more writing in Chinese. And in 1969, he's the president of the Taipei Chinese Center. He's doing a column uh, that he wrote for the uh, Taipei Chinese Pen, uh, P-E-N. That was an acronym for poets, playwrights, editors, essayists, and novelists. And he had a readership in the millions. So he, it, within the Chinese readership. He was uh, back to being a superstar and, and you know, certain, certainly in, 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 uh, in some circles. But uh, so what happens after that? Uh, so 1971, his daughter commits suicide and it's kind of the, the beginning of the end for, for Lin Yutang. He moves to Hong Kong. He gets a, a, a position or he, he starts working with a dream team of philologist at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. They produced the Lin Yutang Chinese English Dictionary of Modern Usage in 1972, um, which is uh, kind of compared to uh, Kang, the Kangxi Zidian and, and some of the other more famous dictionaries. I mean, obviously, it's a modern form. And his two daughters were both in Hong Kong at the time. They were both living there. So I think that was an uh, additional impetus for him to move to Hong Kong. And I think the uh, Kangxi Zidian, he despised it so much, and he had this lifelong passion to come up with a better solution 
a better dictionary. So uh, that was uh, one of his passions. And as a result, the Lin Yutang Chinese English Dictionary of Modern Usage uh, came from that. So in some ways, it's the it's fitting that he does this dictionary when he does, because shortly towards the end, uh, he has a stroke and 1976 passes away at his home in Yangming Shan. So the last work he published was in some ways the one he always wanted to publish. And that's for a writer. That's a pretty good way to go. Right. The, the, the project you've wanted to do your whole life is the one you publish right before you die. So, you know, 1980s, he gets this uh, new interest in his work. He's allowed back into China. He's already gone, but he gets a, a second look again. And but in terms of the West, he's really become sort of a non-entity. I've been trying to think about that. And I mean, one of the things I think I've sort of stressed already is that he got everything about China wrong. Not everything. He got a lot wrong. I'll have to disagree with at least part of that statement, because if you've read some of his more scholarly stuff, especially his translations and things, uh, the stuff that no one read. Well, but I'm saying he didn't get everything. That's what I mean. Not everything. Um, a lot of his scholarly stuff I will definitely be using in some mm -hmm. of my projects because it's really well done. So another thing I think, uh, which I, I'm not sure we've mentioned yet, he coined the term yo mo, that is humor, way back in the 1920s. Chinese didn't have a term for it. A lot of his writing is very much uh, humorous, and it it's a kind of humor that just doesn't last. It grows. I, I think all uh, all literary scholars who try and be funny, oftentimes they may initially achieve success, but normally it doesn't la last. I mean, I, I can only think of really Mark Twain as someone who's a writer who was both funny and who has lasted. Even Jonathan well, Swift. Moliere, who's now 400, yeah. 500 something years old. What Don I, Quixote. Jonathan Swift, I would say, is, is... There's actually lots of humorists who've lasted. Okay, Shakespeare's whatever. very funny. Anyways, it didn't work for Lin Yutang. Did not work for Lin Yutang. That is definitely true. Uh, what I would say, though, is my answer to that question would be when, whenever you get a reputation as the explainer of something, you're very much a creature of your era because you can only really explain it based on what people know about it. Then it's very much a, a period specific thing. Like if I, if I get, you know, if our, if our podcast for whatever goes through the roof and we have millions of subscribers, when, 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 <laughs> when our podcast, yeah, it's just a matter of time before we become millionaires. We'll design a new typewriter. <laughs> right. Too. Like, like you, right? Laszlo. Yeah. Well, Lazlo's way ahead of us. So. <laughs> um, but, you know, if, if we get a reputation of explaining China and millions of people listen to us in 50 years is a good bet no one's going to know who we are because... We'll have gotten everything wrong, just like no, you. No, because the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the different people have more information. They have more avenues for learning. I mean, in the 30s, if you want to know about China, where did you go? Definitely not Hollywood. No, definitely. <laughs> no, geez. Yeah, that, definitely not Hollywood. But now... Or even even by the '80s, there's so many other avenues for no reading this stuff. Even popularly, you don't have to to read Lin Yutang. That's 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 somebody from a bygone era, right? You know, I have books downstairs on my bookshelf from the '70s and eight. No, from the yeah, from the '70s that yeah, yeah they're cringeworthy. I can't I can't even read them. They yeah. they completely <laughs> got things wrong. But those were the mansplainers. Of that decade, you know, when China was on the cusp of uh, emerging from the Cultural Revolution and some get it right, some get it wrong. I, I guess the lesson is, even if you're as famous as Lin Yutang, you need to be humble about what you don't know. And not say, I'm going to explain everything about a people to you. Well, he certainly is popular still with uh, amongst uh, amongst many. I, I don't think in uh, the English speaking world, but in the Chinese speaking world, I think he still has uh, some popularity. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had that uh, topic requested as uh, many times as I as I have. And I would like to to make just a quick uh, close, not maybe a closing argument. It's not a debate or anything. Um, but for as dated as a lot of his English language stuff is, there is still a lot there. That's worth checking out. Like um, Moment in Peking. Moment in Peking, I still think is a very good novel. It's not a masterpiece, but it's very good. And it's written in English, which it's, as you mentioned, he was very good in English. Importance uh, of Living is actually interesting as well. I would say 
take a take a look at it if you get the chance. I, I think my country, my people is is not really um worth uh worth the time, but the importance of living has some stuff. But as a as a writer's life, he has a very interesting one because um you know, you know, Laszlo mentioned in the in the the fifties, especially, or actually fifties and sixties, really, uh, you didn't stake out a middle ground on something like communism. But to some extent, Lin Yutong's entire life was a middle ground, except maybe talking about the Japanese. And that that kind of figure tends to take a while to get taken seriously. The best equivalent I can think of uh in China is Zhou Zoren. Zhou Zoren was blackballed in China for a long time. Um, and really only became a person people started studying again, at least in the universities in, in, in the nineties, like late nineties. Now he's highly regarded, but it took a long time for people to take a look at him again. And so I'm, I'm wondering if Lin Yutong is due for a revisit. Do you think that English scholarship will, will start to, to look at him more? I, I think so. I think there's going to be a point when we start looking more at some of his writings on, you know, philosophy and aesthetics and go, wait a minute. This guy did more than just write a moment in Peking. He also wrote about a ton of other stuff. Did you ever, in your Taiwan travels, uh, visit his uh, home? It's been turned into a museum. Uh, he's buried there. I have been past the museum, and I, I I think it wasn't open when I was motoring past on my little Taiwanese moped as I was mm. going up Yangmingshan. Um, so I've seen the outside of the building, but I haven't been inside. Yeah, I've been to Taiwan, but I've never been there either. His wife, uh, Liao Tsui Feng, she, uh, she passed away uh, age 90 in uh, 1987. So uh, they're both interred there. Well, this went better than expected. I think we uh, <laughs> managed to pull this one off. It's one of my longer episodes. Well worth the wait, if you ask me. We'll have to do this again uh, sometime. Yeah. Shall we uh, make a date to cover the most requested topic? in uh, the China History Podcast, the great Jin Yong and the wuxia genre. Would you... That'd be exciting. Let's I wrote do I wrote most of a dissertation chapter on the history of wuxia, yeah, so that could be fun. I get that. That is, as I said, that is the single most requested topic. So, uh, all right, very good. Game on. Okay, Rob, Lee, the check is in the mail. Be looking for it. <laughs> uh, I had to post date it, but I'm sure uh, you're right. okay with this. This was fun. Any uh, last words? Thanks so much for yeah, letting this us. Is, this has been great. Thanks yeah. for having us on. Well, you heard it here. Thanks, everyone, for listening. This here is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from 900 miles south of Lee and Rob here in the Jewel in the Crown of Southern California in water-starved Los Angeles. Once again, may I humbly suggest you find time in your busy schedule and join me in two weeks' time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.